Hello, everyone. Uh, Richard Miller here, and welcome to Never Not Here. And uh, we've just been kind of in love with talking. You know, people uh, come on, people post on the site. You know, of course, we have our teachers, our uh, our guests, and uh, but we want to hear from everybody. And uh, so you don't have to be a so-called teacher, you know, <laughs> or uh, a presenter of, of non-duality. That's not really what we're all about, you know. We're just about life and we're about, you know, what makes life tick. And uh, we want to know from you and from everyone else what makes their life tick and, uh, you know, what we can discover together just by by dialoguing. And today we're, uh, we're going to have a really good look at uh, what I'm doing, actually, because we're with Rick Archer. And uh, he's actually doing uh, the same thing we do at Never Not Here. He's got something called G Buddha at the Gas Pump. And uh, that's actually interviews with people that are talking about life. And he's in a really cool place that uh, I've always wanted to visit, uh, Fairfield, Iowa. And uh, a lot of people that are interested in, you know, what is true about life have gravitated to Fairfield and, uh, I guess, We'll let Rick tell us what 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 the ambiance is like there. But and anyhow, Rick, uh, welcome to Never Night Here. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate it. So, have you lived all your life in Fairfield, or? Uh... Yes, but the first uh, twenty some odd years of my life were spent in Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, oh ho! <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't tricky. I didn't move to Fairfield, Iowa until 1987. So I've been here ever since then. I have a thing for Fairfields, I guess. Right. And uh, I am not a teacher, as you say, but I have been a teacher. I taught Transcendental Meditation for 25 years. Uh, but I wouldn't, you know, to a great extent, I was parroting uh, things I had been taught to teach. I don't, you know, did not consider myself to be some realized person who was necessarily speaking from experience when I spoke of higher states of consciousness and so on. Uh, I was just uh, parroting. But, you know, I had been practicing meditation since 1968 regularly, and so there was some basis of experience, which has been growing ever since then. Uh, but I did actually, you know, become uncomfortable after a while with saying, talking about things that were not my own personal experience, you know, that I could only kind of intuit or, gra or reach, you know, just sort of intellectually. And um, for that and other reasons, I haven't been teaching in recent years. But I'm good at asking questions, so that's one of the reasons I started this interview show that, that I do. So in a way, anytime there's a very large teaching and uh, very many people are, have the honor to teach it, uh, and I guess there is a whole university in Fairfield, right? Yeah, there is. It's called Maharishi University of Management, and I actually used to teach there, too. I taught desktop publishing, uh, you know, using computers to do print media, and uh, it uh, has been in existence since the early 70s. It was, it was founded by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who was the founder of Transcendental Meditation, and um, there are probably over a thousand students altogether, uh, although that some of them are in branch campuses in other places like India and China. And uh, there is a, you know, it's an educational program that goes from preschool all the way through PhD. There's a, a you know, children's school and a college and so on. And um, then there's a whole community that kind of grew around that. Um, all in all, there are probably, I don't know, three or 4,000 people in this town of 10,000, 10 or 11,000 who practice meditation, um, and a thousand of those are um, Vedic pundits who were flown over from India, and they're on a sort of a branch campus up north of town in their own compound, and they spend their days doing Vedic rituals and, you know, chanting Rudra Bhashek and all sorts of Vedic ceremonies and so on, uh, for the purpose of cr uh, the understanding is that that creates an influence which is, you know, kind of good for the world. Um, that's one of the, the tenets of the Transcendental Meditation Movement, that the Vedic recitation of Vedic uh, uh, yagyas can have a, a subtle but powerful influence to help create world peace and so on. So uh, there are similar groups in, in other parts of the world, but this is probably one of the biggest ones here outside of India. 
And uh, then there's a whole community that has grown up here. Um, as I mentioned, people have bought houses and raised families over the last several decades. And uh, then, and so there's those people with a tight TM affiliation. Then there are people like myself, actually, who have kind of grown away from the TM movement or moved away from it, um, who still are on a spiritual path but don't feel a close affiliation with that organization, but nonetheless, you know, respect and appreciate the benefits that they derive from it. And then there are people who are moving to town who have no TM background, uh, who might be, there's one couple that's a friend of mine who are, uh, friends of mine who are uh, Ekankar students for ever since they were teenagers. And another that I can think of who's into the waking down thing, which Samuel Bonder founded. And, uh, and many others. I mean, I've seen Harry Krishnas go through town, <laughs> all kinds of people. Uh, so there's a sort of an eclectic spiritual community that has grown up here, somewhat to the chagrin of the hardcore TM people who feel like, you know, they're just trying to siphon off, you know, Mar Marshy's uh, students. But, you know, people in one size does not fit all. And there are people who, who just have to follow their own paths and their own hearts, and, and they appreciate the atmosphere of a small town where there's such a uh, preponderance of, of spiritually oriented people. And uh, there's a very li lively cultural scene. For instance, last night we were up uh, at the town square wandering around the, the, what, what they call an art walk, which happens every month. And the, this, the theme of this one was Italian night. <clears throat> so they had, uh, they had artists flown in. They had an artist flown in from Italy who was doing sidewalk chalk painting, and they had Italian musicians and Italian food, and also it's a uh, you know a lot of people kind of and there's all and uh, a band playing Beatles songs, which doesn't have anything to do with Italy, but but uh, actually tourists came a whole busload of tourists came in from somewhere else in the state, I don't know where. Uh, so Fairfield is sort of a, a, a lively, diverse, creative place, and people, different people appreciate it for different reasons. Do these things uh, get sponsored by the city, or do they get sponsored by the merchants, or uh, uh, what? Like uh, these yes, nights? yes, and yes. I mean, it's kind of a. There's a. I mean, there has there have been culture clashes over the years. Uh, you know, when the, oh, this whole gang of meditators came in with strange ideas and strange ways of eating and dressing and building their houses and so on. I mean, there are all these Stepatyavedic houses all over town that have to face east, and they have little pointy things on the roofs and all that stuff. So you know, a lot of local farmers kind of scratch their heads and wonder what this is all about. But, uh, you know, over the years, many businesses have been founded by meditators, and th there's been a lot of intermixture and even intermarriage, so to speak, between, you know, the different cultures, and it's the, the, the boundaries or the edges have blurred. And the mayor, him, the mayor of the town is a longtime meditator, um, and everybody's cool with that. And the city council consists of some people who meditate and some people who don't. And, and it's not like the, the Rajneesh thing in, out in Oregon where the meditators are poisoning the salad bar um, it's, in order to win seats on the city council or something. It's a, a fairly friendly uh, and cooperative and synergistic uh, arrangement. Um, and, you know, there's still points of friction. You know, the, like, for instance, there's been this effort to get uh, some construction done on the train crossings so the trains don't have to blow their whistles when they come through town. And some people saw that as a meditator initiative, you know, and, and therefore opposed it. Um, and recently we had a consultant come in from Burlington, Iowa, <clears throat> who had accomplished the same thing in his town. <clears throat> and he was explaining how, you know, towns which do this it enhances their quality of life and they appreciate it. So it's you know, people said, all right, well, maybe it's not a meditator initiative. And, and there's kind of, they're coming around more to that. You know, so anyway, I'm rambling a bit, but go ahead and ask another question. <laughs> I want to ask about, you know, about meditating, I guess, and mm -hmm. about TM. You sure. Know, and I don't want to really, uh, a commentary on TM and stuff, but I mean, here's an ambient uh, where people are studying uh, Vedic, reciting Vedic uh, mantras and chants, and then uh, they're making some practices according to a certain theory, mm -hmm. which uh, many uh, uh, people probably uh, are willing to testify that is based in truth. Uh -huh. And uh, somehow there's an idea that uh, there's an arrival, there's some kind of a um, possibility to 
arrive in a greater with a greater sense of attention mm -hmm. at some something that mm, is true in life and uh, and in a way I guess what is that am I right in in suggesting that this is a desire for freedom yeah well I'll, I'll speak from my own experience um, I learned TM when I was 18 in 1968 so that makes me 60 now and I was a messed up kid you know I was taking full advantage of everything the late 60s had to offer you know drug sex rock and roll and um, you know I had dropped out of high school I'd gotten arrested a couple times for marijuana possession and you know, I was really sort of aimless and floundering and I, but nonetheless I you know I had a spiritual bent I was you know reading Zen books and other spiritual things and when I was taking drugs I was sort of telling myself that it was enabling me to explore higher states of conscience or whatever and uh, after I've been doing that for about a year and was really getting you know more and more screwed up um, one night I was sitting in my bedroom at you know, on acid, my friends had gone home, and I, my mind was spinning. And I was reading a Zen book, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. The book happened to be, and it struck me like a lightning bolt that these guys that I was reading about were really serious. You know, very dedicated spiritual aspirants, and I was just fooling around uh, by comparison. And, and I realized that if I'd continued fooling around in this way, I was going to end up living a very unhappy life. So I thought, well, that's it. You know, I'm going to stop taking drugs and I'm going to learn transcendental meditation, which is the only thing that was well known in those days as a spiritual practice, and I'll just see what happens. So there's a long story about how I actually got in to learn. It was in New York City and I was living out in Connecticut and all these adventures and so on, getting in there and getting started. But I ended up starting, and, uh, and right off the bat, from day one, from the very first sitting of it, I felt tremendous relief and tremendous release of, from a, a heavy kind of weight of confusion that, and stress and, and that had burdened me. And uh, being a sort of a, a kind of an obsessive guy, I just determined to practice it regularly no matter what. And so I just started the practice twice daily, never skipped and uh, you know at least half an hour twice a day and these days it's an hour twice a day but it's been it's fluctuated over the years and it, my life began to improve I mean within a couple of weeks I had gotten a job and gotten back into school and uh, you know my father was startled and said whatever you're doing I want to I want to do it so he ended up learning after a while and then my sisters learned and so on um, and I just stuck with it you know I, it just uh, really improved my life in many sort of practical ways while at the same time providing a, a rich inner experience uh, very fulfilling gratifying rejuvenating and um, you know the longer I practice it regularly the more clear and um, stable that experience became then af after a, a couple of so years in one way this stability is practical but in another way it seems like it, it maybe is a platform to to be uh, what it, what would you say? I mean, uh, I don't want to say necessarily serious, but let's just say uh, um, sincere. Yeah. Sincerely uh, looking at what's true mm -hmm. instead of just uh, fooling around. You know, serious seems like a disease sometimes, but anyhow, mm. sincerity might be a, a good way to say it. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd say that when I was just taking drugs and stuff, I wasn't very sincere. Um, I was using kind of a spiritual alibi for just an indulgence in teenage craziness. And, uh, you know, but at a certain point I realized this isn't going to do it. And, you know, your life is going to go nowhere if you continue like this. And, and it, it, you know, I said to myself, if you really do have genuine spiritual aspirations, you ought to do a, some kind of genuine practice you know do something real that's actually going to help you and um, so I gave that a try and it was the first thing I'd really tried in fact after a few months I went into a I, I, I kind of adopted the attitude after a few months of, well this is wonderful but it's you know it's not really for the heavy-duty guys who want enlightenment or not, you know or bust 
And so the heavy duty guys was the, was more like the monastery. Or yeah, yeah. That about in Zen bones, Zen flesh. Exactly. So so actually, even though I was meditating regularly, I, I wrote away to a, a Zen monastery and said, "Can I join this?" And and they said, "Well, you have to study with a local roshi for six months and get his recommendation." So I went into New York. That was another big adventure. We had our car towed and had to sleep in a parking lot all night and all that stuff. But uh, <laughs> I went into New York and met with, a, sat in a little session with a local roshi, and um, you know. I was kind of thinking in terms of moving in that direction. And th then I went to a TM residence course, like a, a week-long retreat kind of thing. And that kind of solidified it for me in terms of realizing that this, this could be a serious practice if I, if I took it that way, and that it was a, a legitimate path to enlightenment or you know, higher states of consciousness. And so I, pr I began to pursue it with even greater sort of diligence going to more courses and eventually becoming a teacher and as a teacher I mean you know we it was became a full-time thing for 25 years and, and during that time we would initially we would teach for like four and a half months here in the states and then we'd fly over to Europe and spend six weeks on a long meditation retreat course meditating you know pretty much the entire day during during the height of the course and then back back home again for four and a half months then back to Europe uh, you know, for another six weeks of intensive meditation, and then after a while, uh, is there just a center, a Maharishi center in Europe that's kind of like offers the, these long? The main long center was in Salisbury, Switzerland, and uh, boy, we we visited some beautiful places, you know, on these courses because we we rent these hotels in the off seasons, you know, up in the mountains in the summer when the skiers weren't there, and then down on the lake in the winter when the when the summer people weren't there, and. So we got to see a lot of beautiful places, especially Switzerland, but also the, the French Alps and other places. Because eventually we started getting these longer courses for six months at a time. Uh, and uh, some people would, would put those back to back and be doing long meditation routine for you know, a year at a time or six months or whatever. So I did a bunch of those, two or three of those. So do you have to uh, keep a job or something so that you can finance all that, or how does that? In those days, I didn't. I mean, in those days, I, I was just teaching, and you kind of earned credits from teaching if you taught enough people that that you could sort of cash in, so to speak, to uh, go on courses. And also, my mother helped me. I mean, she had a little bit of money. I, sh I really took advantage of her because she didn't have that much. She would pay for some of these courses sometimes. My sister also became a teacher, and she was going on them, um, but. You know, so what's the effect of six months of uh, solid meditation or, uh, or one year of solid meditation? I mean, it was very profound. It was very profound. I mean, you would you would come out feeling like a different person altogether. It was like you you'd go in as an old you know rickety VW Beetle and come out as a Mercedes Benz. You know, you you just. <coughs> Um, on the other hand, you so needed. That, you know, that means like uh, what you're talking about is stability, right? Something about uh, because didn't we say before something about a stability of uh, even when you were talking about a teenage a teenage years. Yeah, and I mean, you know, for some people, such long meditation can be deleterious. I mean, if if there's sort of an imbalance in the personality or something, you know, you can flip out when you do that much meditation. And so there was a screening process in enabling in allowing people to go on those courses to begin with. And despite that, there were some flip outs on some of those long courses. There was a big long course in in Mallorca, Spain, which was a teacher training course where, you know, pretty there wasn't much of a screening process, and all kinds of people came. And you know, there's some serious psychiatric cases resulted from that that kind of long meditation. Um, but you know, if you if you didn't suffer that fate and and you survived, <laughs> uh, it was a it was a profound routine. And and then it would take integrating. I mean, you couldn't just do that perpetually. You'd have to get out into activity and. You know, live live a relatively normal life and engage in practical day-to-day -day stuff in order to kind of integrate. Speak speak, uh, speak really about integrating. What what does that mean? I mean, you well, know, you know, you could what's you the could, process? You could what come happens? home from a come course like that. And what happens? There's some a relapse or something like that, or well, ye yes and no. I mean, if you were in the middle of a course like that, uh, you know, meditating eight hours a day or something, and you just walked into town to go to a to go to a store or something. It would be too much, you know. You'd be so steeped in in sort of the inner experience that you couldn't handle even a simple walking down the street with cars going by. Uh, but and so generally, you you sort of stayed in seclusion on a long course, and then gradually came down less and less and less meditation as the end of the course approached, until you're back down to your normal amount for a few weeks, and then you'd go out into the world, hop on a jet, and go home again. 
and uh and and when you first got home again it would take a while to sort of totally get used to being in the world doing normal stuff uh but it would happen well, anyhow it takes you know if it takes you know, i mean what you're saying is it takes a little time and yeah there's some re-entry and stuff like that and um these of course are not just pure thoughts but they're all body mind spirit yeah, the whole physiology was the being whole transformed. Phys physiology, so there's a certain amount of uh, feelings that go with it, and maybe some. Is it like angst, or is it like? Uh, I mean, uh, okay, you're giving up a, a a great piece. There was this process which was referred to as unstra. You remember the Beatles song, uh, "Dear Prudence." A little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was written about Prudence Farrow, who was Mia Farrow's sister, and. Uh, she was on a course like the type I've been describing in Rishikesh, India with the Beatles and Marshi and everything. And uh, she was in her room day after day after day doing these long meditations. And she had taken a lot of drugs earlier when she, you know, before then. And she was really getting kind of nutty, very nutty and uh, kind of unstable. And uh, but I'm sure if you if you would talk to Prudence, which I I, I, st I still kind of remotely in touch with her, she's doing fine now. But what happened was when at least the way this process worked was that when you did long meditations like that, really deep seated, uh, deeply lodged stresses in the nervous system, which you might not even have been aware of, and which were um, influencing your behavior, constraining you to a much more restricted kind of perspective or worldview started to release started to un and, and as they released you'd begin to experience all this stuff that had been buried you know emotional stuff perceptual stuff uh, I mean I had a friend on one of my courses that um, had also taken a lot of drugs and she was you know basically seeing hallucinations uh, as this these deep stresses started to unfold she'd see birds flying around that weren't really there and they'd be landing on her in, in her room and landing on her head and, and so on and so forth um, so it was it was kind of a crazy scene, uh, but so anyhow, that was what was happening in all those courses, right? Because even in a simple satsang or in a simple weekend retreat, there's enough silence or there's enough <clears throat> what shall we call it, um, you know, interresonance or something between the people that are are in that retreat that uh, your 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 daily run, your mind run, let's say, is disturbed enough not even disturbed, I would say, just uh, relaxed enough, let's just say, that something bubbles up, you know, and it, it comes out as, <clears throat> you know, something that, if it bubbles up, it means that you've been pushing it down, right? Or otherwise it would have been up already. So exactly. So pushing it up, down, in a way, it's something that you are not proud of. You know? Yeah, not, and there are other ways of doing this. I mean, there are different kinds of therapies and so on where people enable stuff that's been buried to kind of come to light, you know, shadow work, for instance, or even the Waking Down, te you know, group has, has ways of doing this. And that, you know, and in, in, it, in having it come to light, it kind of enables, it can be dissipated if you deal with it properly. There in other a, words, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's managed in another way. It's not just a... Uh, let come up and uh, and fly. It's some, somehow looked at and, and anticipated. And, yeah. Uh, you know, prepared for in some way. And so then, in in, in some way, it's 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 lessened or, or eased or yeah, or dissolved or, uh, or whatever word you want to use. And in the case of this procedure that I've been talking about, it was more of a physiological thing that would take place. I mean, you'd get you'd settle into a, the mind and body were interrelated. So when your mind became so settled as it did with all that long practice your body would become very very settled and uh, and then these deep stresses would begin to unwind or begin to unfold and uh, and then because again the mind and body are interrelated when the deep physical stresses began to unwind there would be a corresponding mental experience you know or emotional experience uh, you know related in quality to the type of stress that was dissolving and you know there was constant reminder from Maharshi or whoever was teaching the course, that this was what was happening. Uh, so so then that would be a deep spiritual experience, because like if things are unwinding, there's an opening and an, an opening. Yeah, something new floods in, right? Usually, while it was unwinding, that wasn't such a neat experience, because it was usually, you know, very often unpleasant stuff that was getting dissolved. But once it had been dissolved, then you felt, you know, a great, much greater freedom and and clarity. You know, once you'd gotten that garbage out. Um, 
and uh, you know, you're it was like I say, your your whole functioning. You came, you went from the old rickety VW Beetle to the Mercedes. You know, you found you, you came out into activity again after such a course, and found that you could think more clearly, speak more clearly, act more effectively, and so on. Um, so that was the purpose of it. It was. But just yet, there's some integration needed. So what did that mean? I mean, did did it stick? I mean, to, to a certain extent, there was a spoke clearly, right? Yeah, there was a uh, analogy that Marshy always used to use, which was that if you wanted the way they used to dye fabrics in India, would they would dip the dye, dip the cloth in in a, a colored dye, let's say a red dye or something, and then they'd take it out and bleach it in the sun, lay it out, and let it bleach, and it would lose most of its color. But then they would dip it again and then put it out to bleach again in the sun. And repeating that process over and over, it, the color eventually became color fast and wouldn't bleach even if you left it in the sun. So he used, he used that analogy to, to uh, illustrate this point that alternating meditation with activity enabled you to stabilize and integrate what was experienced deep in meditation so that it eventually would not be lost even in the most hectic dynamic activity. Did that work? Yes. Because, you know, when I've heard that story before, it was from a guy that had been meditating even 40 years and never missed a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got it from him that he really believed that the meditation was one thing and that it doesn't really come out to your day-to-day -day life. You did know? for and me. He said the die thing, but he said the faded part, but he never did say that it there's eventually doesn't fade, you know. <laughs> Uh, got to keep going back. You got to keep going back, and so that was my experience. And you know, I think that even if I were to stop meditating now, um, I wouldn't lose what I've gained. Uh, maybe I wouldn't progress as quickly anymore. Although I know some people who meditated for years, had an awakening, decided they didn't need to meditate anymore, and they still seem to be progressing very quickly. They've got different sort of engine on their train now. Uh, but it it definitely worked for me. And I mean, you know, I can be in the most. Let's go in and say what is progressing. Uh, well, by my definition, progressing means we're, it's like we're all reflectors, you know. We there was a line from the Incredible String Band, if you remember them from the '60s. It was, "Light that is one, though the lamps be many." And uh, you know, if the kinds of people you've been interviewing, the kinds of things you've been thinking about, you probably are familiar with the the notion that you know, underlying all the diversity of life, all the different personalities is a, a sort of a, an essential fundamental field of consciousness or awareness and we all reflect that differently uh, or express it differently you know and we're all we could think of ourselves as being reflectors lamps it's like electricity you know we have a, a electricity and you can you can power all sorts of appliances with it all sorts of different light bulbs some light bulbs might just be little 25 watt ones one, others might be a big powerful searchlight that a, the lighthouse would use they may be different colors and so on but it's all the same electricity and it's just according to the the structure of the light bulb or the you know the way it's made that it's able to express whatever it does uh, so using that analogy uh, you know, our nervous system is that which enables us to express or reflect consciousness, and we're all conscious to whatever degree. And we can refine our nervous system. We can change the way it functions, uh, and that's what spiritual practice is all about: meditation, uh, other kind of fasting, whatever spiritual practice people do. Let me ask you this: do. you know, because you said we're all consciousness to a certain degree, conscious, or, or to a degree, or yes. I don't know exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, <clears throat> what does that mean exactly, you know? Well, what it means... I mean, is yeah. there more consciousness and less conscious? I mean, everyone's conscious, right? right? They might not be conscious of what you're conscious of. They might be conscious of their thoughts, or they might be conscious of self-limitation or, or mm -hmm. illusions of self-limitation. Mm -hmm. But uh, the conscious part is maybe the same. I don't know. Well, is I, it yeah, it is. Well, I mean, what I'm suggesting is that consciousness itself like electricity in my analogy, is the same, one and the same for all people. Your, your consciousness essentially is the one and the same thing as my consciousness. We are the same consciousness. And that's what this whole non-dual thing is all about. We are the same person, essentially, you and I. But, but your nervous system and my nervous system are two different reflectors of that consciousness. And each one uh, reflects it somewhat uniquely. And we can say that of all the seven billion people in the world, all the millions and trillions of animals in the world, you know, in, from insects to, you know, elephants, whatever they may be, all the same consciousness 
at the very core of their existence, but according to the type of nervous system, uh, it, that consciousness is reflected or expressed in a unique way. And to my understanding, uh, what spiritual practice is ultimately all about is becoming a better reflector. <laughs> and I know that some spiritual teachers don't like this whole notion of better and of levels and of progress and of all that stuff. Uh, so, you know, be that as it may. But anyhow, all those things are thoughts, right? I mean, they're thought-based. Well, we're thinking about them right now and we're talking about them, but what we're really talking about is an experience. We're not just talking about a concept. So, I mean, you're, you're a spiritual guy. You're but doing, I mean, yeah. uh, sometimes some people are actually saying that an experience is a concept. Without the concept, the experience wouldn't happen. And then they're not giving concept uh, uh, much more weight than a thought. Well, I think concepts enable you to interpret experience. I mean, if you uh, had never tasted a mango before and somebody gave you a mango, a piece of mango, and you ate it, you'd think, well, this is delicious. I wonder what it's called. You know, and then they might say, "Oh, it's a mango," and then then that adds a concept to an experience you just had, and and then they might say, "Well, they're grown in India," and then you might say, that adds another concept to an experience you just had. But whether or not you, and then you might learn how to grow mango trees and so on. But whether or not you start adding all those concepts, the let actual you, eating of the me, mango. Let me, is you give me a contrary example. Then, okay, because I get that one. <clears throat> Let's say you go to the Af African uh, savanna, you know, the, uh, the mm -hmm. sub-Sahara or something like that. Sure. <clears throat> and you have the experience of heat, of course, mm -hmm. and you have the experience of sweating and uncomfortable sticky clothes, and maybe you have the experience of uh, bugs, mm -hmm. and they're flying around, and maybe you get some bites and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then somehow you're with a, an African man or a, like a primitive man that just lives out there and has been living in a primitive way, let's say. Mm -hmm. And he takes you and starts showing you in the bushes and stuff like that. There's these tracks and then there's this scuffle and then you can see the bent little twigs on the plants. And then uh, he's, he weaves a whole story of what animals passed, what they did, how long they've been there, uh, who took what, who ate what. Uh, and the, he's got the whole history of the place for the last week, uh, when it rained, uh, you know, and, uh, and just by looking at a few broken twigs and stuff. But yet, because we don't have any of those concepts, we don't have that experience. It's not there whatsoever for us. Well, that's a good point. I mean, you, you and the African man are both experiencing the same twigs. You're both looking at the same footprints and so, but he sees a whole lot in that that you don't see. I see zero in it. Yeah, you, see, you just see twigs and you see footprints. You, you, essentially, you're saying this, but he's interpreting it much more richly with much more detail and knowledge and understanding than you are. Uh, but you are essentially having the same experience. I, I think it's actually a good point and you can draw a parallel between that. In other words, I'm saying I'm not having that experience. I'm having the one with bugs and sweat, you know, and he's having the one that this is a rich place and that uh, I'm going to have a meal here and that I can feed my whole family on, on if I just follow these tracks. Yeah. And he's got a whole, you know, this, his, his He's his noticing life. stuff that you're he's not noticing. He's noticing his life, how his life works, and I'm just noticing uh, suffering. Right. And and you could potentially notice what he's noticing. You could, he, he could say, you know, look at this twig, and you say, yeah, I see the twig. But, and, but now to that, to him, that twig means a lot. He interprets a whole lot out of it. For you, it's a twig, and the bugs are biting me. Let's get out of here, you know. Uh, so everybody is conscious if, if they're alive. Yeah, but I mean, you know, okay, look at it this way. Here's six billion people having six billion experiences, mm -hmm. and there's a hundred of us in one room, and so a hundred experiences are happening. Right. So that I'm not having any of the other 99. I'm only having the one that I'm, I'm somehow my concepts can embrace. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that uh, I don't, th I think there's so much in the world that passes through. You know, we don't need, I mean, even just look at the fact that we only have a small window of frequencies. Yeah. Of sounds and of lights that we can perceive. We wouldn't be able to function if the window were a whole lot bigger. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so then, therefore, there's tons of things that we're unconscious of, and uh, and then we only have a certain amount of conceptual baggage that comes from like uh, what we what we identify with, which means that we think it's important, mm -hmm. and which mean might means that stuff that you were talking about that bubbles up in the long courses there, 
Yeah. You know, somehow those things keep bubbling up until somehow we're willing to, to uh, let them be at rest. And uh, so then I'm saying that uh, a concept and an experience could be the same thing. Mm -hmm. Just lately I was talking to a, a guy and he was posing the, uh, the question like, how do you get intellectual understanding to be uh, uh, experiential, uh, what did he call it, Ex experiential awareness? Mm -hmm. And uh, is there a way to speed that up? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was kind of wondering if intellectual understanding isn't an experiential awareness, because there's the experience of uh, intellectual understanding, and uh, that's an experience too. And uh, it's just not the one you were expecting or the one you're wishing for. Mm -hmm. And so then to say that it's not an experience, and to say that something else is an experience just because it's what you wish for, uh, or because it's broader or wider or feels more open or feels like a, um, a more peaceful, uh, I'm not so sure that that is a distinction that's true. I think that the, in my understanding and experience, I think the two are correlated but somewhat loosely sometimes. Um, in India they have what some people call babbling saints who are realized people who nonetheless don't really have much of an intellectual understanding about their realization and so they may speak about it but they don't make a whole lot of sense maybe there are some people like that in the West too and you know conversely there are people everywhere who maybe have studied a lot of philosophy and spiritual matters and so on uh, and you know read a lot of books who could tell you a lot of things about it and you know I mean I was this way when I was 18 I was reading these books and I could sit there and you know rap for half an hour about some spiritual topic but the experience that I was talking about was I didn't really own it. It wasn't really clear. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think that you know when there is a genuine growth of, of experience taking place, then intellectual understanding is extremely valuable uh, in order to corroborate and supplement it. It's like real enlightenment if there is if we want to use that term involves both experience and understanding. And I am drawing somewhat of a distinction between them. Um, because, you know, if we're thinking thoughts, speaking words, it all represents concepts that uh, are ideas that, you know, an idea is not the thing. I mean, an idea of dinner is not going to nourish you. And like that, an idea or concept about consciousness or, or the essential nature of the self uh, is not necessarily going to be that the experience of consciousness or the essential nature of the self. Let's go back a second to the babbling saints. Uh -huh. because, okay. Okay, so uh, these guys uh, have some kind of great peace, or it seems like some understanding, but there's really, you know, their presence might be uh, uh, felt. Yeah. You know, and that's how people uh, acknowledge that this guy is somehow uh, aware. Right. But he has no way to... And he may uh, be aware whether or not people acknowledge it, because someone's yeah. realization isn't really dependent upon anybody else's acknowledgement. Yeah, but otherwise he wouldn't come up on the radar. You know? Right, he, right. Those, those other guys are not even babbling. They're, not, they're just back right. there somewhere. They're just driving the wood, rickshaws you know? or whatever. But the ones that are out there and that we're going to call babbling saints, because we're calling them a saint, something, uh -huh. somehow we can feel a, a presence about them and something ha change, shifts in us maybe just by being with them. Yes. But they can't articulate it. Okay? Right, right. So now the other one you were saying is like, okay, somebody can have a lot of spiritual knowledge, you know, because he read books and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And then somehow his experience isn't the same. But yet he's having an experience, see? And, I'm, and what you're suggesting is that somehow his experience should ma match up or match up with uh, spiritual lore that uh, the Vedas and the Upanishads and uh, the, the traditions and the history have enough truth to them that uh, that's the way it's going to look for us too. But I'm suggesting uh, that maybe this, uh, this guy could just articulate his experience, whatever it is right now, his experience, because this is what is real, for, this is what's happening. Because I mean like the spiritual lore right now is what's not happening, you know? It's only what's in your thoughts and what's in your head. And what's happening is very mundane maybe. You're letting the dog in, letting the dog out. And, uh, but that's, how can that be any less spiritual? How can uh, that be any less imbibed with life? Yeah. It, 
Well, let me take that from a couple of angles. Um, in interviewing people who've had spiritual awakenings um, and you know just knowing them from being in this community and my various travels over the years, uh, many people have said to me that when they did awake, it, even though they had read a lot of spiritual books uh, and so on over the years, it was completely different than anything they had anticipated. In other words, the concepts that they had formed as they were on the path and aspiring to enlightenment and so on did not, didn't do justice to the actual experience that dawned when an awakening took place. Um, and I think that, you know, one way of understanding that or explaining that is that <clears throat> you know, there are different levels of consciousness and knowledge is different in different levels, in different states of consciousness. Uh, the, the knowledge in the waking state is different than the knowledge in the dream state, which is different than the knowledge in, let's say, cosmic consciousness or, and so on. And even though you know, people in various levels of consciousness may perceive the very same phenomenon or, or situation, they're going to perceive it differently according to their state. Like, for instance, you mentioned letting the dog. Um, I just let the dog out and in a couple of times. And, you know, my experience of that was different than it would have been when I was 18 years old and hadn't embarked on a spiritual path. Uh, very same objective circumstances, but a different orientation toward them. Or another example I, I, I might use is, um, you know, last time I traveled, I was uh, late for a connecting flight and I was running through O'Hare Airport at Christmas time, uh, out of breath, uh, racing to catch a connecting flight. You know, it was way over in the other terminal or something. And uh, so there's all this chaos at the airport and my lungs are burning. Uh, I'm running along and boots on my feet. And uh, at the very same time, uh, I felt like silence was my predominant experience. There was a, a profound peaceful silence that I that was really me and that also even permeated the chaotic environment um, now that was a different experience than I might have had 30 40 years ago under such circumstances and was you know a direct outcome I think of having done the whatever spiritual practice I've done all these years well you know we can say it's a direct outcome but we really can't know it can we because I mean in a way Maybe it's just a, a gift of, uh, of uh, sophistication of, uh, uh, you know, of anything, you know. I mean, I guess we, we have the tendency to say what we did caused what, who we are today. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, but we can't know that for surety. Maybe not. I mean, I don't know anything for sure, you know. It's just correlated. In other words, it correlates. You right. Know? Like you said before, I think you were mentioning what's correlated. What I do know is that, you know, when I sit down to meditate and sit there for an hour and then get up afterwards, I feel different than I did when I sat down. It, and it, I feel different than I would have had I watched TV for, for that hour instead of sitting and meditating. I, I feel like the windows of perception have been wiped a little bit cleaner and uh, there's a sort of a greater infusion of, of awareness or, or whatever. Uh, and the, but anyhow, that's an experience, and that's an experience that does match up or meld with uh, with the spiritual lore. Lore. I'm just going to call it lore, but you mm -hmm. know, spiritual tradition. I'll say if that sounds better to you. Yeah. And it matches up with spiritual tradition, and in a way, we're saying that uh, at least I'm saying that, uh, or I'm posing that mm -hmm. uh, your whole town is has got a um, a tremendous spiritual tradition attached to it, with thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, both the Indian people that are doing the chanting, and then uh, 3,000 people, that are, or a thousand or so in the university, and mm -hmm. then thousand, maybe a thousand that have been in TM and have kind of not, t not, don't, not teaching it anymore. But I mean, there's a huge tradition there. So then there's a huge uh, knowledge base, let's say, right. that is uh, based on that tradition, and you know, then also there's a huge um, effort, let's say. And, then, and and maybe a noticing too, but a but effort and no. So in other words, effort is effort, and noticing is more effortless. Mm -hmm. But that's just uh, uh, noticing that uh, life can more and more correspond to uh, the teachings that we grew up with and that we've imbibed in these last decades. Well, I, th I think so, I understand your point. I think it's a good point. I mean, if 
if we grew up in a Native American culture, for instance, or in a Buddhist monastery, or a, you know, uh, you know, a, a South American shaman community, or something like that, um, we would have perhaps different experiences and different um, a different whole philosophical structure that we related to, you know. And um, you know, and it might, in many respects, be quite different from what I'm expressing, having you know, with with my particular orientation and background. Um, I, I just want to add that, and I'll, I'll get back to that, elaborate on that point in a second. But I just want to add that I, you know, you refer to all the the spiritual lore and the, and the ancient traditions. I don't think those were cooked up out of nothing. It wasn't a bunch of guys sitting around entertaining themselves, just dreaming up, um, you know, kind of randomly philosophizing about things. I think, you know, all the genuine spiritual traditions, whether Christian or Buddhist or, or whatever, arose from experience, uh, a profound experience that the founder or the writers of those traditions were having. For instance, many of the things Christ said, I mean, Christ wasn't just an ordinary guy walking around doing stuff. He, you know, if you could step inside of his eyes, so to speak, step inside of, see the world through his perspective, you would probably find it to be radically different than the way you see the world, or you know, the, or the, the way people ordinarily see the world. He wasn't just sort of special in terms of his personality. He was in a prof he was living in a profoundly different state of awareness than the average person, and it was by virtue of that that he had such an impact. Um, you know, I totally agree to that. You know, I'm I'm not questioning it at all how the origins of uh, spiritual tradition. But I am saying that now when we're holding them as a, as a body of thought, mm -hmm. and uh, a body of thought is not really all that connected to our life, you know. I mean, in a way, it, uh, when I was saying that we experience what our concepts are, uh, in a way it's connected to our life because somehow that body of thought we're also experiencing uh, because that is what we hold and what we see. But I'm just saying that uh, um, trying to, uh, you know, I, I think there could be a temptation to try to fit our life into that too, you know. And uh, and the fact is that um, uh, yeah. we're not having the same uh, uh, immense experiences that the originators of these uh, of these traditions are having because they weren't holding a body of thought; they were just looking at life mm -hmm. raw. And uh, maybe some come from a lineage. Some, uh -huh. Maybe some were holding a body of thought. I, I don't know that, you know. Right. But I'm just saying that, that that's the the alternative, you know. That I mean. Yeah, I think I understand your point. Useful, you know. Right. But I mean, I'm, I don't think it'll take you to the goal. It can be useful in a certain part of your life. Even even you said that at at a, at a certain point, there's some people you in, included that are not teaching TM anymore, but you're practicing. Yeah. And there might be a point at which it's no longer relevant for me to even practice. I mean, uh, you know, if you take a boat across a river and you get to the other side, you might as well get out of the boat. <laughs> you know, it's not getting you any place. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's another river up there somewhere. I might need this. It doesn't leak yet, you know. Yeah, there might be. But I guess the point you're getting at, and I think I agree with it, is that um, our experience can be conditioned by our our understanding and our conceptions and our our sort of philosophical orientation, we can kind of overlay... Well, it just must be. You yeah. Know? It just must be, because otherwise, how can there be six billion? Yeah. Absolutely. And I've had discussions about this sort of thing with friends, uh, you know, where they they kind of claim or, or, or posit that there are different qualities of enlightenment according to what you conceive of it and, or understand, of it, understand it to be. And I kind of like the idea that enlightenment, as you said a minute ago, is just the raw truth without any uh, conceptual overlay. Uh, but, you know, again, we, we grew up... You know, even, even that's a concept, definitely, because maybe there's no such thing as no conceptual overlay. That's just kind of like taking the, whole, the thing the whole way. Yeah, I mean, if but you're I mean, alive, I, I, you I, have I, to... I would quote the Vedas, too, you know, and say that uh, there's only one truth. There's many layers of ignorance. Mm -hmm. So that there is not many layers of enlightenment or many la layers of truth. There's only one truth. I agree with that, you. Uh, and that uh, there's many perceptions of truth or many uh, interpretations of truth and some of them are let's call it slimmer mm -hmm. you know and then some of them maybe don't hardly even exist like we're saying is it possible that there's just no concept and and it doesn't have to be possible you know right. just because uh, mathematics will say there's an infinity and a zero there's probably neither 
You know, they're both figments of our imagination, you know. And where would other, there ever be zero? Because the finer and finer and finer and finer you look, there's going to be, there's some little ray that's going through there or something. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that was kind of what I was trying to get at, your statement that there's only one truth but just many layers of ignorance. When I was talking about, you know, there being this sort of essential reality of consciousness and then many different ways in which it's reflected according to all the different beings that reflect it or that live it, namely all beings. Uh, in my analogy of one field of electricity, many different light bulbs. And um, yet, I think that uh, what very often happens, and maybe this is a slightly different point to take the direction the conversation in, is that people in very, with various personalities, having grown up in various cultures, can all arrive at that one truth experientially and, and you know, appreciate it with, with crystal clarity. And yet they still have a personality. They still have a cultural background. They may have, you know, po different political opinions or, or, you know, religious orientations and so on. And what very often happens is people look at them and define enlightenment in terms of their particular individual characteristics. The personality part. Yeah, the personality part. Because that's what we see. Because that's what is dominant in our in ourselves. If personality is dominant in ourselves, then we see someone else's personality. You know? Yeah, and and the guy might not for so, uh, so much believed in in ourselves. Then we probably see the inner truth in everybody too, because like a guru doesn't see all the personalities; he sees the divine in everybody, right? He does, and he, I think he also sees you know different people have different personalities. He doesn't lose the devil, the ability to discriminate. Uh, no, right, but he doesn't believe it. He doesn't believe that's who they are. Per, yes, essentially that's not who they are. Uh, and it's it's only secondarily, in a sense, who they are. But you know, no no one, no matter how enlightened they may be, uh, you know, is devoid of preferences. I mean, if you take the most enlightened person in the world and give him two plates, one has dog poop on it and the other has a, a delicious meal, I, t I guarantee you, 100 percent of them are going to take the delicious meal. <laughs> uh, you know, they have preferences. If, if you, as one of the people I interviewed recently said, you know, you go to the most enlightened guy in the world and say, well, I can. I can set off this dirty bomb in New York City, or I can dump it in the ocean. He's going to say, "Dump it in the ocean." You know, he he makes choices. He has ha, he has attitudes. Well, preferences. you know, I mean, one thing that an enlightened person might have is appropriateness, because he might take the dog poop and bury it in the garden, and it'll make something grow. You know, yeah, yeah. He knows where it goes, and he'll take the plate of food. And if there's two different plates of food that are more or less the same, and he might have a preference, but if he gets the other one, he's not going to uh, in any way be hurt. Right. By that. And what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, I mean, we'll leave the dog poop out of it, but what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that what f people very often mistake the personal preferences of uh, a, a supposedly enlightened person as being characteristic of enlightenment itself. So if some enlightened guru or something has a particular political attitude, you know, the person will say, well, that's kind of the cosmic perspective. That must be the truth because this, this enlightened person looks at it that way. Therefore, I should try to look at it that way. But I, I'm suggesting that's a fallacy and that, you know, you're, you're entitled to have the completely opposite uh, political perspective while yet respecting and appreciating the enlightened. I, I keep using the word enlightenment. I hate it, actually, because it has such connotations. <laughs> but while yet appreciating and respecting the, this sort of like the realized state of that person. Different strokes for different folks. So many times these days, you know, we try, they make distinctions. Now, I'm not even so sure. This is an, maybe conceptual also, because that, you know, what can be held as an idea. Uh, in other words, what's here right now really doesn't need any idea. Like when you're in deep meditation, there's some, there's something exists, right? Yeah. Like I exist, or, mm -hmm. you know, I not meaning uh, my ego necessarily, but, right. you know. There's a perceiver somehow, or something, a witnesser, or you know, all those words have limitations and mm -hmm. so on. But I mean, something exists and with with or without thoughts. Right. But other things, conceptual matter, uh, doesn't exist without a thought. True. And so then, uh, it's only limited to uh, uh, to a, to the conceptual apparatus, and, uh, and the conceptual apparatus, oftentimes we find, is not really tied to what's real. It's tied to what was yesterday or, or where our conditioning came from. Yeah. And so then it's not all that uh, trustworthy. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know. you know, there's a beautiful quote from Jesus, he, which I've been thinking about a lot lately, uh, in which he said, The foxes have their holes and the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. 
And what that quote means to me is that, you know, for Jesus, who referred to himself as the Son of Man, uh, there was no refuge in any conceptual cubbyhole. Uh, he, you know, he, was, he contained all the concepts. He wasn't contained by them. And I, I think a lot of people experience something akin to this as they grow in, along the spiritual path, which is that they can no longer sort of fit with securely and, and adamantly into a per particular perspective. They can see the perspective, and yet they can say, on the other hand, there's this. In fact, there's this, there's this book in the Indian literature called the Jaimini Sutras, which I read many times in the TM movement. And I, it's, I don't really, didn't really understand much of it, but he kept using this phrase, on the other hand, and that's the one thing that stuck with me. Uh, or if you didn't read that, you can just, you, maybe you watched Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, you know, there's, you know, any story, any particular perspective doesn't embrace the whole picture, doesn't encompass the whole reality. And we as human beings tend to lock ourselves into particular perspectives, particular stories, uh, you know, whether politically or spiritually or m emotionally and relationship-wise or, or whatever. But so that's only a half truth, in it, other words. Not even a half. Like, not even a half. It's just a sliver. Oh yeah. <laughs> just okay, a, just yeah, one I mean, little point on the this. sense that every uh, every uh, every uh, uh, health has its disease to go with it. Every uh, you know, in other words, the con every concept has its negative built in it. Exactly. Because it's not really. There's no such thing as uh, a black and white. There's only more and less white is what we call black, and less black is what we call white. Yeah. And without the two of them there, I mean, uh, somehow it's one coin. It doesn't even have two sides, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just what concepts are. That's not what things are. You know, there is no object that has the, those two properties that we have to try to put it together. Mm -hmm. It's only a concept that's wrapped around uh, a perception, and it says this is an object, and that concept has has two components to it, a plus and a minus. Well, you know, plus and minus only means what I like and what I dislike. So it has, but it just is, uh, it has duality in it, yeah. uh, in other words. A very, uh, very dear friend of mine, a um, young man, 25 years old, um, committed suicide about a week and a half ago. And uh, just last Monday I attended and actually spoke at his memorial service at his parents' house. There are about four or 500 people there. And it really shook this community up. Uh, because, you know, this guy was well loved and respected by a lot of people. He's a very bright young man. I was actually going to interview him on my show because I considered him to have to be an awakened person or to have undergone at least a significant stage of awakening. And, uh, you know, and a lot of people at this... I was mean, that the guy that had a pretty strong illness? No, he, he committed suicide. He, there was nothing wrong. Uh, there was nothing wrong with I him. I thought maybe he just was ending, uh, you know, from the illness. He didn't want to live through it anymore. He was perfectly healthy. Okay. Um, and his parents, you know, kind of shocked everybody by putting this very positive spin on it. And not that certainly not that they weren't grief stricken by the death of their son, but that they they felt like you know he was sort of he had been so different all of his life, such a sort of a cosmic kid, so to speak, and that there could possibly be some sort of uh, cosmic rationalization for what he did, like he, he was just unable to live in this world and wanted to reunite with God or something. And a, a lot of parents in the community got really upset at this because they felt like it was going to give their children a justification for doing a similar thing. They, they felt it was being condoned. And the point I tried to make at the service was that, you know, this point I was just making that they're, you know, Certainly, we're entitled to our perspectives, and it's natural and human to assume a perspective on any given event. Uh, but you just have to give yourself and others the latitude to have their perspective, even though it may be completely different than yours. Uh, it's it's legitimate for them, given their orientation, given their makeup, and you know those of us who get too locked into our perspectives end up starting wars or flying airplanes into buildings. Uh, we just are not seeing the bigger picture. And, and perhaps my friend who killed himself was definitely too locked into his perspective. And it, it sort of, it causes us to act out of accordance with the whole of life, with the, with the total goodness of life, when we're just too fixated uh, or, or constrained by a particular viewpoint. 
we again we have our somehow view. that calls for uh, you know to for me that kind of calls for uh, dialoguing and for like open dialoguing and open dialoguing to me means no expectations or no c condemnation yeah and uh, massive amounts of tolerance yes and then when people can air these things and saying you know that life is this way for me and somehow I'm I'm grossly unsatisfied with it and then somehow that can go come open you know and mm -hmm. otherwise if that is something that just can't be shared with anybody. I mean that's a tragedy, uh, and yeah. it's really um, uh, an honor for you to be so close to it. And uh, ironically, this kid was very good at actually helping people broaden their perspectives. I mean, he, I discovered after he died that he had been meeting with a couple of friends of mine, person, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis, for the last year, and had really transformed their lives. You know, I'm talking about a guy who's my age uh, that he'd been meeting with weekly, who looked transformed totally. He said he he, he enabled me to sort of lift such a burden from my own shoulders in terms of my my you know pent up emotions and my neur neurotic tendencies and so on he just and it, he saw through that and enabled me to see through it and and to free myself from it uh, but yet he couldn't sort of free himself you know he didn't have anyone who who whom he had access to who could help him break out of that. Or perhaps he was just, you know, suffering from some biochemical disturbance, you know, manic depression or something. Yeah, but I mean, in, in your community, I mean, is there, is, there must be a lot of people that could be turned to, right? Yeah, I mean, there are, you know, there are. And, and your community is so rich. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing place, really, um, full of all kinds of, you, I mean, there are people walking around this town, running businesses, raising families, who routinely, you know, see angels and gods and, you know, have all this celestial vision and, and you know, are, are in very highly enlightened states and, you know, might be working in a factory, but they're kind of living in a state like that. Um, and, you know, yeah, anyway. <laughs> you were saying something pretty interesting to me, at least, that uh, um, somehow you find, well, a couple ways we phrase it, you know, that there's really somehow sometime you find that there's really no slot for for you to fit in you know in other words as far as like how your your awakening is looking mm -hmm. is one thing we were saying and then we were uh you know we were i don't know somehow that the, uh we were talking about the the many lamps and the and the reflection of of uh, of the truth mm -hmm. and that uh, uh the individuality is a part of the of the grand seems to be a part of the grand scheme uh, yeah. you know like the individual expression let's say mm -hmm. uh, of even the one truth and so then um i think it's so i think we can easily acknowledge that there uh when we were talking about the uh the traditions and the teachings that uh are very very strong and centered around certain well Maharishi's teachings as one of them and mm -hmm. there might be other ones too in the community mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the teachings uh, are not infinite in how many slots they have you know and so then they're very useful at a certain point when people are uh, just coming on to this and just realizing that the, and not talking about necessarily a slot where I fit in but the gender the, uh, the the generic direction and so on. Mm -hmm. These uh, there's some classifications or broad classifications. I'm a druggie or I'm a I'm a you know a recovering addict or I'm a <laughs> I you know I'm a meditator. Uh, things like that are very useful. But then at a certain point, I mean, I'm wondering, uh, you know, because uh, really good teaching uh, in order to give freedom it really has to become obsolete very good yeah. point it's like i said before you know when the boat reaches the other side of the river it's time to get out of the boat and uh you know there so just one just to finish that thought and a really good teaching in, in another way needs to be have a hole at the top where people could get out you know yeah, yeah. and maybe and and usually holes at the top uh the sangha the congregation uh you know the the devotees mm -hmm. uh they don't like that hole and they don't like to see a lot of people escaping i mean even you said it because you said mm -hmm. that uh, some of the the maharishi people or the tm people uh, uh res in a way resent uh, other teachings that come in and so so called dilute their you know take away their price yeah. you know and they actually have a tendency to boot you out if you get involved in those i got booted out because i started going to getting involved with ama you know the hugging saint yeah yeah right and uh and, yeah, Amma you know, comes there every year, right? Yeah, she has been, yeah. Uh, and she's not coming this year, but she's coming other places around the country. But, uh, 
I didn't mind it too much. I, I would have minded it 20 years earlier if I'd gotten booted up, but I think I was, I was ready. I, I kind of think of it as an incubator, you know, and many spiritual f- movements can be thought of in this way, that it's an incubator. And at a certain point, you know, the chick begins to peck its way out of its cell and, and, and uh, out of its shell, and it's no longer relevant for it to stay in the incubator. It needs to fly. And if it tries to stay in the incubator, it actually, you know, probably creates trouble for the other eggs and, and, and retards its own freedom and progress. So, you know... And so my question is, like, in, in your town, I mean, and in, your, in the TN movement, well, you know, I don't necessarily need you to make comments just on, on any kind of one movement or anything like that. But in your town, let's say, is there a lot of pent-up energy that just says, you know, freedom is... You know, I'm, I'm doing a service, I'm teaching TM, I'm, I'm serving a lot, you know, and people are benefiting by what I'm doing, but somehow, I don't know, and I'm doing my meditation uh, two hours a day, and uh, I get a great peace from it, but is this it? I think some people feel that way. I, you'd have to, I mean, each person has their own story, but I think there's a certain subcategory of people who, you know, I've talked about this sometimes on my show, that, that you know, you could categorize people into different... Uh, attitudes but uh you know there's there are some people who feel like well i've been doing this for 30 or 40 years and probably uh, at this rate i'm never gonna reach the goal whatever that may be and but i you know so i'm just going to keep doing it because i don't know anything better to do and then there are other people who actually awaken uh, and some very often i find it's people who kind of leave the incubator as i said and then undergo some sort of awakening. Maybe they leave the incubator because they're on the verge of undergoing awakening. I don't know. And and then sometimes the people in the first category I mentioned resent those people and, and say, well, you know, you you couldn't really be awakened. You're just on an ego it's trip. A, it's a false you, awakening. You're right? off the, yeah, you're, they all say that. Yeah, right? you're off the program. That's every master that anybody that says they're awakening. Even with Ramana or something like that. I mean, I was in India two years, or uh, not this winter, but the one before. Uh-huh. And there's some very, very beautiful, you know, like saints or just like real peaceful, you know, skinny little guys. But yeah. anyhow, really wise people, but they, oh, I'm not a teacher. No way, you know. Oh, no, I wouldn't be filmed. No, no, no. Mm. You know, and I mean, because it would, it would come back on them and hit them on the head because yeah. everybody would say, you are teaching. Why? <laughs> just stand the Ramana. He's right here. Yeah. You can feel him more now than ever. Right. You know, I mean, they would say, like, there's only one teacher, Ramana, you know. And, uh, Light that is one, the lamps be many. But um, my attitude toward it is that, you know, I don't know, that, that there are many degrees of awakening. And, you know, maybe some people who say they're awakened, it's just a baby step. It's just an initial degree. Maybe There may be dozens more stages they're going to progress through. Be, 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 and, and I don't even know if there is any sort of final stage. I mean, I think that the greatest saints to ever walk the planet would probably acknowledge that there's still some sort of growth for them to undergo and you know which may be far beyond the conception of somebody who's just starting out well i don't know you know and, you know one thing is to say there's growth but another thing is like we were saying weren't we saying that uh you know i'm getting a little confused because i just did another interview but I, <laughs> uh, we, were, we were just okay let's just talk about uh like the illusion you know mm-hmm. the illusion is in movement and uh this movement, you know, I mean, is part of, I mean, even saints participate in this illusion, in this movement. I mean, there's always a movement, and uh, that could be what you could say is the stages or the um, progression or something like that. It's just flowing with this movement and, uh, and maybe uh, receiving mm-hmm. the movement as it plays through your instrument. And uh, accepting it too, receiving and accepting might be a little different because you receive what you like and you accept what you don't like, you mm-hmm. know. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, and that's just your likes and dislikes or your preferences, and maybe it's strong or maybe not, you know. Uh, there, you know, you, we were just saying, enlightened people have preferences just like everyone else. Mm-hmm. And uh, okay, that's uh, you know, just the movement is, the, is is staying with that, but it doesn't necessarily mean there's uh, lots of stages or lots of things to... In other words, because otherwise if we say there's a lot of stages of enlightenment, then uh, we're always trying to get somewhere, you know? And, and how can we be here if we're trying to get somewhere else? If we're acknowledging that there's another stage to get to and I should go deeper. I mean, that's just a thought, you know? And, that, and the effect of that thought is it takes me away from this moment and uh, if it takes me away from this moment, then it's just like... Uh, uh, 
Well, I see your point. Counterproductive, right? Yeah, yes and no. I mean, I think you can acknowledge that there is progress. Hold on just a second. Uh -huh. uh, close that door a second because that oh, changes sure. the light a little bit. Sure. You know? I think you can acknowledge that there is plenty of progress yet to undergo and yet be content with where you're at now. It's like, you know, to take a simple example, a person is in school and there are various grades they go through as they're in school. And if they are, if they say to themselves, well, I'm just in the fifth, uh, let's say they're in the fifth grade, and they say, well, this is school and I'm studying what I'm studying. And if I, you know, if I uh, acknowledge that there might be high school and college and graduate school to go through, then I'm not really, you know, uh, doing justice to what I'm doing right now. But that's not necessarily the case. I mean, they can totally focus on the fifth grade, learn everything it has to teach them, uh, be who they are, appreciate what they're learning, but there are going to be further unfoldments for them if they continue their education. So I understand the whole bit about be here yeah. now and, you know, Eckhart Tolle's thing of, of living in the present, and that's very true. But Eckhart Tolle himself will uh, tell you that, you know, established in, in the present moment, there is yet plenty of uh, unfoldment and de deepening that can take place. Well, uh, one thing about the fifth grade is that it's already a belief in a progression, so then you can be at ease with that progression. You know the steps, you know. Yeah. But, I mean, <clears throat> uh, there's no fifth grade of enlightenment. I mean, There is, unless though. You, unless you say there is. I, I, mean, I say there is. I say that you, you and I are not Ramana Maharshi or, some, or, or Amici or someone who has, uh, you know, a much more pr mature, full level of experience. You know, we're, we're experiencing the same thing. I mean, uh, you know, if, uh, if Amma were to look at you, she would see herself. She would see that same self that, that is in everyone, as we were discussing earlier. But it doesn't mean that we're all equal in terms of our ability to... Uh, you know, in terms of the clarity with which we experience that level of life and in terms of our ability to express it and impact the lives of others with it. I guess I can acknowledge that, you know, but I mean, I don't think that's a very uh, a hugely useful place to go, you know. <laughs> it can be. I mean, you know the Ur Urban Guru Cafe folks that have that whole... I I've heard of them, yes, yeah. I have. I listen to all 74 of their, of their interviews, and I listen to new ones as they come out. And uh, there, there is this sentiment there that any sort of discussion of levels or of seeking or of progress or of any, anybody being sort of more highly developed spiritually than anybody else is a crock and, and it's really not a useful way to, to look at life. And I can see their perspective, you know, I always do this with things, I can see their perspective, but I respectfully disagree as well. Uh, because I don't think it's practical in terms of what we actually experience in, in life. In fact, one of the main people uh, in that discussion uh, who's responsible and involved and does a lot of the interviews on that show said at one point to one of the teachers she was interviewing, well, you I mean, is this all there is to it? I mean, it seems so ordinary. And, uh, and there was evidently a, a sort of a longing or a, a lack that she was feeling that she, didn't, that she felt like there must be something more to her experience than what she was experiencing. And, and, you know, and again, I agree with you that always chasing the dangling carrot can be a stumbling block. Can be, at some point you have to kind of relax back and say, okay, what I've actually got now is very significant and, and it may be actually what I was looking for. But at the very same time, there is a, there is always room for growth. It's, it's like a paradox. It's a, con it's, you know, a, it's a paradox. This is my take on that. This is my take on it. That, you know, she... She would never get an answer. Is this all there is? She well, well the answer she got was, yeah, this is it. You know, relax and enjoy well, it. Well, <laughs> I mean, that wasn't an answer to her. Right. Well, that was not an answer to her, and she will never get an answer because she was asking a question, a uh, uh, mental projection, quest, projected question, and there's no answer in, in, in uh, there's no mental answer that is it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so she's never going to find anything there. Uh, until that becomes less important to her, that question mm -hmm. has to be is really has to see through that question and see that that's the wrong question to ask. I'd have to say that if I had a favorite word, it's the word paradox. And the reason I like that word is that any kind of assertion you make about anything, it, you can always find a sort of a paradoxical other perspective that's you know equally valid. 
and you know, and that is not to say that there are not somehow qualitative differences between different ways of understanding things. But a paradox is also a thought. It is. You know, it only exists in thought. It doesn't really exist in nature. Very good. And so then, uh, if you want, you know, the thoughts do have parado paradox, and we can acknowledge that, and then that's not really what we're looking or what we're seeking to, res we're not really seeking to resolve that paradox. You know, we're seeking to have it become less important so that our focus can uh, actually drop it. Yeah. And uh, really just uh, sit with what is, you know, and not to deny it or try to throw the paradox out, because uh, that's like an impossibility, but uh, just to... Uh, to see what is uh, is before the paradox. Now there actually there actually are a par is a paradox in nature, but maybe not. Like for instance, we know that light is both a particle and a wave, depending upon whether you're observing it. But it's only a, it only becomes a paradox when an observer gets involved. I think. So that observer is a mind. So yeah, right. An observer is a mind. So a mind created particles and a mind created waves. There's neither. Exactly. In nature, there's neither. That, that, so sure. it really proves your point. I mean, be, so with, only when the observer starts muddling around the, do we get the paradox. And otherwise, nature is fine just as it is. Uh, you know, but what I'm trying to say is that all these assertions and statements and, and theories and attitudes and so on that we that we adopt about all these different points, you know, we it, it would serve us well to remember that, as you said, they are just thoughts, they are just concepts, and uh, and in the realm of concepts, there are always going to be, you know, other truths. You know, Byron Katie is so good at showing that, you know, whatever you believe, pretty much the polar opposite is probably also true. You know, she gets people to flip it around. Uh, but uh, but again, but she's not trying to really say that they're both true. She's just trying to say that look, even the opposite has an effect on you. Neither are true. Right. You're not that. Yeah. Which maybe is what Zen Cohen's always tried to do. You know, to get you to sort of give up the dualistic wrestling match with with concepts and just relax into something you know which is much more fundamental and unified, which resolves all such paradoxes even the word give up you know it's, uh, you just realize it's futile you know yeah. <laughs> this don't hook together and these don't go together you know yeah and then the whole thing is in the garbage bin and what's left is uh, life exactly what uh, I went a lot of fun talking with you Rick yeah it's great Richard I'm glad we did this uh, right so uh, we'll have to go on your website which is you've got a it's bag app yeah BAT GAP dot com, which stands for Buddha at the gas pump. And if you go there, then there are links to some other things that you can do. You can find out about like a chat group and a YouTube channel and a, uh, um, I don't know, something else, a podcast. And also I've linked to some other interview shows like this, including yours. So there's links to that, to the Urban Guru Cafe, and a few others that I've found. So it's sort of a, a kind of like a little central station place for for you know checking in on what I've been doing and yeah. what I'm interested in for checking in on consciousness right, right. right. <laughs> what's going on in Fairfield yep and beyond all right on <laughs> okay all right so well, we I guess we'll just thank you Rick and uh, you know it's been a, been our pleasure real pleasure thank you Richard we'll be in touch okay hey so everybody uh, thanks for coming this was uh, Rick Archer uh, we're here in uh, in uh, well, Fairfield, but all around the world, actually, because the Internet is all around the world. And uh, so I'm glad you could make it this time. So thanks so much, and goodbye for this episode. <laughs>